one, two. Check me out right here, yo. Let me turn the track up a little bit for me. All up in my head. The mic is loud, but the music is loud. Yeah. What is up, podcast land? Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates in the Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kugler. And before I introduce my very special guest, calling all the way from down under in Australia, my friend Tex Jonathan, uh, do a little house cleaning. Um, number one, I am here live on the Squawker app um, from the Yellow Jacket Media Studios in the bustling Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. Um, love it here. An amazing group. Um, great shows. So if you uh, get a chance, to subscribe to all the Yellow Jacket Media podcasts, uh, I would highly appreciate it. Um, the show is brought to you by my company, E-Force Strength. Um, E-Force is uh, the leader in eccentric strength training development. We have technology called E-Force 250 and 350, which allows us to attach to uh, squat racks, half racks, and provide offloaded assistance, meaning I can remove weight from a barbell in either direction, the down or the up. And uh, that's important because that's how you um, overload the muscle during the eccentric, which is the down, and concentric is when you're lifting the weight. So being able to do that traditionally was done with bands and, and chains and things like that, and we decided that that's just a little bit archaic and not very precise, so we created some technology that is both advanced, new age, and very precise. Uh, for more information on eForce, go to eforcestrength.com. All right, my friend Tex, and uh, we've been friends on social media. We've talked on the phone. Um, we follow each other's stuff, and uh, she's an amazing, uh, energetic, um, vibrant businesswoman, author, speaker, coach, you name it, she does it all. So without further ado, I'll introduce Pix Jonathan. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Matt, and thank you for the wonderful opportunity and privilege to be a guest on your fantastic podcast series, Two Dates and a Dash. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. Um, as you know, as, as you've seen a couple of the, uh, and listened to a couple of podcasts, um, I ask one question and I try to keep mm. it simple because simple is, is me. I'm not a very complex human being. Um, so for me, the one question is always, um, as a cop, I ask one question when I'm trying to solve a crime. And it's usually a, a broad question that allows um, the, the person's brain to sort of go in different directions, allows me to figure out whether or not they're criminals or or victims and, and what, where, what happened with the crime and how things transpire. So that's how it works for me in my brain. So that's how I try to run the show. So the question I'm going to ask you is who is Pix Johnson? Ooh. Now here we, yeah. have, we have some dogs in the background. <laughs> um, and that's a really interesting question, Matt. Um, it is a simple question to a very complex person. As you say, I do a lot of things. So who is Pix Johnson? I'll start off. I love acronyms, Matt. I like to keep things simple. So, Pix is passionate, she's inspirational, she's exciting. Really, the guts of it, I'm a 53-year-old um, single mother of two very resilient young adult children who are independently funding their own lifestyles. Um, I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I'm a coach. Most importantly, I'm very passionate about living healthy inside and out and the new Pix is a very different person to the old Pix, Matt. Well, the old Pix, yeah, go on. I was going to say, I, and, and yeah, I've done a little bit of research, not a ton, because I try not to get too knowledgeable because I like it to be interesting for me to find out things. Um, I don't want to know the, the ending to the movie before I watch it. So yeah. I try to make sure I don't know too much. But I do know that there's some, there's some, uh, some difficulties you've ever came um, early on in yeah. your life. Yeah. Want to talk yeah, about Yeah, and that's... Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you, I kind of asked you, Matt, what was the audience and, um, you know, was anything out of bounds? And really, no, it's not. So I want to share a bit about my past um, so that that inspires others to go, you know what, it's not what happens to you, it's how you handle it and how you move forward. So the first thing that really impacted me was when I was growing up in a beautiful, loving family, I will say, and I'm the youngest of three now too because my sister sadly passed away 12 months ago and that's part of my story. But I am now a survivor and a thriver of child sexual assault. It was not a family member. It was an evil predatory neighbour. And that happened probably from when I can remember from the ages about five, six, seven. And it happened for many years 
completely unbeknown to my parents. And the minute they found out, that's when, you know, they acted on it and I did have to make police statements and everything. And I'm actually not pleased that it's happened to me. It's happened for me though. But I'm grateful that I've got through that because it literally has made me who I am today. And I touched on being the new pics as opposed to the old pics. And child sexual assault or any trauma, be it childhood or adult trauma, manifests later in life. And you don't know in what capacity that's going to manifest. For me, it was a little bit of promiscuity, but most importantly, it was low self-esteem. As positive as people thought I was, I didn't value myself nor my body. I didn't value who I was. And I was married for about 17 years to a lovely man. And, you know, we had a really good relationship. However, we've chosen different paths and that's completely fine. I'm still friends with him. He is the kid's dad, so I'm very blessed there. But I have subsequently, prior to that and subsequently after my marriage, chosen relationships that have not been, you know, fulfilling and they haven't served me well. I've been in abusive relationships, not physically, but emotionally abusive relationships. And it's been, I guess, a tough gig, but the minute I took my power back from that abusive relationship, he was a narcissistic, overweight, depressed, alcoholic, and not someone that you would see the new pics as being with. But the old pics was like, yeah, that's all you deserve. My friends could see that I deserved more, but until I could see that, I kept going back. We'd split up, I'd go back. We'd split up, I'd go back. And I always wondered, Matt, how women could never get out of relationships like that. But until you live it and you experience that, you don't know. And the same goes for a, a man because there are emotionally blackmailing or emotionally um, relationships that are not fulfilling for men as well. So I understand that. I know. But yeah, so, I'm going to yeah. interrupt you real quick because as a police yeah. officer, I see this. I mean, I've been a cop for a long time, 26 years. Yeah. And I've, yeah. I've been in many um, domestic life yeah. situations yeah. Where, mm -hmm. where I see and I hear the stories the, the, from both sides. Um, and I, I, I totally understand when you say that you didn't feel like you deserved it. And mm. now that PTSD is a, is a well-known terminology before you were just depressed or sad or, or whatever mm. the, the term was, but now it's, it's got a label and it's got a label that everybody understands and everybody's acknowledging as real. Do you feel PTSD is the right classification for what you went through after your, your sexual trauma or, or no? That's a really good question, Matt. Um, I haven't actually per se been diagnosed with that because I get that there's different levels of depression and some need clinical support and things like that. But I personally don't want to label myself. I was diagnosed with depression in 2005 and just to enlighten your audience, some of the other things that have happened to me. When I was seven, my grandmother was, I was in a car accident. We hit a truck and my grandmother was killed. And my mum and I couldn't even go to her funeral because we were so bad. I got through that. Um, and then years later, my now ex-husband and I, we were engaged. We were coming back from a business meeting. We hit a Mack truck and both of us were nearly killed there. And then 10 weeks to the day later, I actually fell asleep at the wheel of a car and um, rolled a car, went down an embankment, landed on the roof. And I thought, why did I get out of this? Um, so that is some of the tragedies that have happened to me. Um, and then I really struggled in my job in about 2005. I wasn't happy in my marriage. It was unfulfilling. I wasn't happy in my job. It was unfulfilling. And I thought there's got to be more to life than this. So I went and saw my GP and he diagnosed me with depression. And I think I've actually probably had something much deeper than that because, yeah, it's, it's what I've gone through and just the different layers and, you know, the abuse and someone shooting himself in our backyard and then nursing my dying mum. She died in my arms and my sister died last year and my nephew committed suicide and I've fallen down a cellar. I've been to the States when the earthquake was on, you know, flying back then and just so many things have happened, but I'm very resilient. So I had labelled myself personally with PTSD, 
but I don't want to hang on to that label. And I'm not downplaying those that do suffer because I know it's a legitimate, you know, diagnosis out there. But I want to look to the future, to where I'm heading, rather than what's happened. Whilst right. all these things have happened to me and for me, I don't want to hang my hat on that. That's the old pics. I want to write a new story, and I am writing a new story. But I think part of of writing a new story is is ensuring that every part of the old story is is given validation, and and has the ability to. Um, live in, in a place that is safe and appropriate for today, but, but yeah. give it the, the context that, that it deserves for what happened. Cause you know, unfortunately I've, uh, I'm, I've suffered trauma, but I, but I also understand from, from friends who were in the military and, and women who have been abused and dealing with kids who have been sexually assaulted. Um, that trauma manifests itself and compounds. And that's what it sounds like with you is, is when you talk about, all the things that happened to you, whether it's the loss of a family member or the, the accidents you were in or um, the depression you, you were diagnosed with in 2005, that's a compounding problem that, that started with mm. a moment in time when you were a child. And, and yeah. I think the, the mindset that you had as a child with, with lacking that self-confidence and that feeling of worth, the, your brain can get turned into a direction where it doesn't notice everything around it. You get lost in this cloud, this fog, and, and you can stay in that fog. And, and I think the thing that is the most amazing about your story is that while you may not want to hold on to a, a diagnosis of PTSD, the overcoming of so many obstacles allows you to have that PTSD as a past tense. Mm. It's no longer part of who you are today. And I, you know, when I was, when my brother died and I went through my 13 years of depression, yeah, I had PTSD. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I didn't know what I was yeah. going through it, yeah. but I don't have PTSD anymore. Like I'm no longer depressed. I'm no longer feeling that way. I hold on to that knowledge that it happened mm. and I, em I embrace the journey. Embraced because, it. Yeah. But I, I don't allow it to define who I'm going to be in the future, but it is very much a part of who I was. Exactly. Maybe we should call it past traumatic stress disorder, Matt. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, I think the, uh, and I'm going to dive as deep as you allow me to dive into yeah. um, your past, um, because I think you know, I, had, I had a good friend of mine um, come on the show and, and talk about the loss of her daughter to the opioid crisis. And the more, I, it's amazing how sharing her story helped so many people. Um, that, that's mm -hmm. my highest viewed video. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's shared all over the place because people want to know that they're not alone and they're not the only person that's suffering. And mm. I think there's so many layers to your story that many people can, you know, whether it's the child sexual assault, whether it's um, physical injuries and overcoming those, whether it's uh, a marriage that was not fulfilling or, or going through depression and coming out of it. All, there's so many different categories people can identify with that I think is important that we, we try to share as much of that and give as much insight as we possibly can so they can understand that maybe there's some similarities to what you went through and are going through and how you came out of it. And if maybe they're not yet at that same stage you are, yeah. that they can see some, some similarities and maybe some hope. Similarities, yeah. And that's so true. You touched on so many things that I've been thinking about, Matt. I share because I care. You know, that's the new pics. The old pics shared because she wanted to be centre of attention. I don't do that now, Matt. I do it because I genuinely care for each and every person. You know, everybody's got their own battles and adversity is not a competition. To a third world living person, trying to find clean water is something really critical to them or putting food on the table for their family that night. That's their most pressing need and they're stressing about that. Whereas for, you know... Yeah, it's just so different for so many people. And you also said about validation. The old pics sought validation in so much of what she did. The new pics, she doesn't. She's, I'm very comfortable with who I am, what I'm doing, and I'm actually headed more towards a spiritual and a sensual journey. And that's really, I guess, becoming of age because, you know, I guess I use my body as a weapon to get back at men because I hated men. This one particular man took my innocence away 
and he abused me and I didn't know we had a special secret it was our special stuff that we used to do and again I'll reiterate none of my family knew I didn't I didn't know it was wrong and it came out about uh, when I was about 11 so I'd had all the all those years of grooming and all those years of you know abuse with this predatory neighbor but now yeah I'm very comfortable with my body and I must admit I only share this temple with you know who I need to share it with and they have to be a very special person and I, I mean that in the, the gentlest way as much as a hug with someone or being more intimate and my, why I do what I do also Matt is my sister chose the alcohol path at 12 she was in a girl's home she was six years older than me so I was like an only child and my brother is 10 years older than me so when I was growing up you know I really at six seven eight there was no other sibling around and my sister in a nurse in a child in a kid's home at 12 like you should be out playing sport or, you know, finding who you are, not being locked up in a bloody institution. And that was because of the abuse that she suffered. And I'm thinking we were both brought up in the same family home. Why did she choose that path? And I chose later on the personal self-development path. And, you know, it was alcohol that subsequently took her life. She died of kidney and liver failure. And, it was her son that committed suicide about two years prior to that. And that's a tough gig for any person because I know the impact suicide has had on, on our family. You know, you always question yourself. But just to have such a dichotomous, you know, daughter, two daughters raised in the same family gives me hope and inspiration to keep doing what I'm doing, Matt. Let me ask you this because you, you brought up something that just – yeah, everything it sucks that everything that people talk to me about, I somehow mm. replay in my mind as a cop and something I've seen before, or heard before, or experienced before. But it's it's my life, and that's the way it's been. But you, you mentioned that you were six years age difference between your sister, and then ten years between your brother. Um, do you do you believe now? Was your sister um, groomed and, and assaulted by the same predator neighbor? Yeah. And when did yeah. they did they find out? about hers before yours or was it at the same time same time same time i had a friend stay over um and we went next door and you know the man used to we used to do stuff in the shed and build things and that and i've always been an outdoorsy person but it was when he took us into the bedroom she knew at age 11 that that was totally inappropriate whereas i didn't because it was our special secret and you know it was something special in inverted commas so the minute that was made, and her name is Susan, and I would actually like to write a second book, Susan Speaks, where I do talk more about the abuse and, and coping and everything. But the minute that was found out, that's when mum and dad, they were absolutely horrified, you know, and they had the guilt of not knowing that their precious daughters had been abused all this time. Uh, so that's when the police came and, you know, there was not a lot of counselling, I will admit, because back in those days, it wasn't really the, the buzz or therapy. Um, but mum, we were, I was raised a Catholic and we got aimed to get support from the church and everything like that. So, no, the abuse was disclosed at the same time. And, and please tell me this is, I'm, I'm getting too personal if, and, and if, if it happens, I'm not going to be offended and please just tell me. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm, I'm my brain goes in certain directions and it's, it's yeah. unfortunate, but this is the world You're I live in as well. Right. So <laughs> yeah. was, was the, the abuse to you and your sister happening at the same time with the, or were they separate individually um, isolated? Separate individual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was happening, happening concurrently, but right. never together in the same room, if that's what you mean. And did you and your sister ever have a conversation prior to it coming out? That it was happening no not to my knowledge matt no although being the older sister i think she knew it was happening to me because in her dying months like last year i went up to see her and uh i didn't tell her i was she was living in emerald which is in queensland another state i was up that way and i knew she was dying so i wanted to go see her i hadn't seen her 
for about seven years at our father's funeral. And um, I, I knocked on the door and there was no answer. And I thought, oh, my God, she's dead because she really wasn't well. And she shuffled out and she, she was 57 when she passed, Matt. And I um, saw her and she looked about 87. She had just aged so much with stress and, you know, the depression and the alcoholism. And I can share, you said, nothing's off limits. She said, what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to see you. And she, well, actually, first thing, she said, who the fuck are you? She didn't know who I was because she said I'd lost weight. And then she said, what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to see you. And I was there for three days and it was actually a beautiful time. Literally, she was dying and um, I was rubbing cream on her back and just helping her. And I thought, do I get her the wine that she wants or do I not? What do I do? And I chose to get her the wine and, you know, that made her momentarily happy. And we chatted and I did say, Ke Kerry was her name, Kez. I said, I forgive you. And she said, don't go there. I don't even want to talk about it. So she absolutely shunned that. But I know I had to give her that permission that I didn't feel guilty for her not knowing or not disclosing. But again, that was her coping mechanism of just keeping it in the box, keeping that lid there. And I guess that's why she cho had chosen that path. And then sadly, that was in the June last year. And then September, I was overseas uh, on a holiday and that's when she passed away. Uh, but mm, I, I helped choose her urn for her ashes. And, you know, that's whilst that was beautiful, that was pretty tough to choose that, book her funeral, everything like that. And that's just made me realise how bloody resilient I am. And it's like, you know, what makes me like this? Why am I so resilient? And it just gives me hope and inspiration to share my story, to go to others that, you know, you can do this too. You have to reach out to help. But hmm, you were going to say something, Matt? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm 100% I'm confident that your, your sister chose her path more so probably out of the guilt and the shame of not only mm. what happened to her, but also what happened to you. And to me. Mm. And, and the reason why I, I say that is because 10 year olds and 11 year olds are very aware. Um, people may not believe it, but they are the brain yeah. you know, in the, in the state of Pennsylvania, yeah. the age of culpability is 10. Mm. So you can be convicted of a crime <laughs> at 10 years old. And it's because of the developmental opinion that at 10, 10 years old, you know, right from wrong. And, know and what you're doing. Know, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would venture to bet that your sister, if it was happening to her and knew that you were going over there too, knew that it was happening to you. And I can only imagine the level of guilt and shame she felt for, mm. for all those years, you know, 46 years. Um, mm. And I've seen the, the drug addiction, the alcohol, the self-abuse that comes from um, living with, with that kind of a, a trauma and that kind of a secret and that guilt. And people don't give guilt the level of power that it actually has. Um, yes. Guilt controlled my life for 13 years. Mm. Um, and anger, uh, which was a byproduct of guilt, um, was even more so controlling. And, and I know for a fact that um, your last three days with your sister were probably her best three days in those 46 yeah. years that she had lived after that abuse. And, and I think when you look at the, the totality of life and you look at you know, the two dates and the dash, the dash. And, and you think about, does today matter? It does. And, and that yeah. value of, of the time that you yeah. spent with your sister um, mattered. And it, it, mm. it, it allowed her to have some level of comfort and, and peace and knowing that you're okay. Yeah. And there's another book I should write too, Matt, is The Funny Side of Dying. Because when I got there, she was smoking bongs. No judgment. It eased her pain, you know. And I won't get political, but there's a lot to be said from medicinal marijuana. 
And anyway, so she was smoking her bongs and on the last day that I was leaving was a Sunday. And I got there and she knew I was coming round to say goodbye, and uh, which I knew would be the last time I'd see her. And she's in the laundry. And I said, what are you doing in the laundry? And she said, well, I'm smoking my joint and my bong. So I don't want it to get on you. Because she said, if you get tested, you'll get pinged. And if you get pinged, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, and I laughed at that. And I thought, well, it's probably a bit late because the aroma's gone through my bags, my clothes, everything. And I go to the airport, Matt, and I'm, it was sunny. So I had my sunglasses on. And um, I get there and they say, are you okay if we screen you? And I thought, this oh boy. chick, <laughs> this, this Pix, who is Pix? Pix does not have a poker face. And I'm thinking... Just stay calm, stay focused. Yeah, sure. Left my sun dark sunglasses on and thought, Kerry, you put the mods on me. If I get tested, was going through my mind. <laughs> Test me. Yeah, you're fine. Go through. I sit down on the chair and almost collapse. Later, I found out it was for testing for pesticides. Pix no. thought it was testing for drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, that's hilarious. And then when I go to board the plane, the name of the plane is Albury. Now, Albury is the last town that my sister and I lived together before she left. And I thought, how symbolic is that? And I touched on it before that when we chose her urn, it wasn't your traditional urn. Um, I rang the funeral company and I said, oh, look, well, she actually said, oh, look, I'm dying and my sister's here. We've got to organise my funeral. So again... Matter, quite matter of fact, but something very tough. Uh, and then they said, I oh, will go on the website and check through the urns. And we were on my phone and, you know, I had technology in the internet and we're scrolling through and I wanted it to be her choice. And I saw a turtle, like a little paper mache turtle, and it was biodegradable. And I love that because I have a degree in natural resource management. So that was me. But it was not about her. This was totally about my sister. And I didn't say any comment. And we're just scrolling slowly. And she said, go back to the turtle. She said, they haven't got a dragon, have they? Because she loved dragons. And no, they didn't have a dragon for an urn, which would be funny because it'd be fire breathing. And then, um, yeah, we read this turtle. And it was made by Fair Trade in Mexico you know, of recycled paper and all this, and it holds so many grams of ashes. And there's a big one and a little one. And she goes, that's it. I want to get that. So we ordered that. And then when I was in Thailand um, on holiday and I found out of her passing, the resort had turtles. So a turtle is very symbolic for my sister now. And I brought, bought each of her three surviving children a little wooden turtle from Thailand. And that's just something special for them and they know that when they're feeling down they just have a look at that turtle and know that her mum's their mum is shining over her and that Aunty Pix, not that they call me Aunty Pix, um, is thinking of them. And so that's helping them cope with their grief and and also the loss of their sibling as well, which is a tough thing. Mm. That's a great story. I, I I think so many people have the, the symbolization part of their life that happened. Yeah. Mine, mine's a butterfly yeah. um, with my brother. And so it's. Oh, it's, I mean, had to come up. Yeah. Go yeah. on. So it's, and mine, and I'll just tell you a real quick story about my brother. So my brother died in 89, um, a month before I left for the army and a month after I graduated from high school. And um, I'm in the army now and, and I get um, ordered to go to the Persian Gulf War. And my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother is German. Uh, my Oma, she was, at the time, she'd had a stroke and she was senile and she was in a home. And my mom would go see her every day. And uh, yeah, she wouldn't know. She'd know my mom as a little girl, not as a grown adult. And but for whatever reason, my mom, I called my mom to tell her I got orders and um, but on the payphone because that was before cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I called her to say, Mom, just so you know, I got orders to go to the Gulf. We're going to be leaving um, shortly after the first of the year. And, uh, just want to let you know, and I hadn't told anybody else. So I go, um, my mom goes the next day to see my grandmother and she walks in and my grandmother's completely clear. Knows my mom, who she is, what mm. you know, generally what age she is. At that Lucid, yep, yep. yeah. yeah. Mm. So my mom says, how you doing? She goes, oh, Andy came to see me last night, my brother. And uh, mm. my mom goes, mom, Andy, Andy died um, over the summer. 
And she goes, oh, I know. He came in my dream. She goes, oh, yeah, what did Andy have to say? She goes, he was going with Matt on a trip. She goes, well, how do you know? She goes, he was carrying a suitcase. She goes, well, where was he going? With Matt to the war. Oh, my God. Yeah. And my mom goes, how do you know Matt's going to a war? She goes, well, Andy told me, and his suitcase had bullet holes in it. And, and I'm, like, floored by that story. And, you know, my mom's, of course, like, what the heck's going on here? And how, to, how in the hell would she even know, um, A, there's a war going on, let, yeah, alone, yep, yep. let alone that her grandson um, that she hasn't seen in a while and lives in Germany is going to a war and, and hasn't spoken to me since um, I left. Um, and then to follow that up, I got to Saudi Arabia, which is where we were based out of. And, based. Uh, mm -hmm. We get to our, our, where we were staying and I walked in and on my cot was a monarch butterfly and it flew away. And I looked, there's no monarch butterflies are not indigenous to right. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I wasn't hallucinating. Someone else saw it. So it was like a full on butterfly moment. So it, it was kind of like that whole connectivity to um, the story that, you know, my mom told me about my grandmother and then the, the, the butterfly and, and there was a butterfly on my brother's grave when he died. So it's like this whole connectivity with a butterfly. Matt, you don't know how symbolic that is because um, mine is a feather with my mum, like I said, who passed away in my arms. She took her last breath in my arms. I was in the bed, not on the bed. I was in the bed at the nurse's um, request. She took her last breath in my arms. So mine is a feather, um, also a butterfly. And it was only yesterday or two days ago, my niece, um, my brother, obviously he's 10 years older, he's got four daughters and um, the second eldest daughter, she was at a football game and her son was going to get an award and somebody, I think the dad was made a life member or something like that. And a butterfly landed on him. So he knew that his nana, my mum, or great nan actually was there. And there's just been so many symbolic things with butterflies. So there's no surprises that you say butterfly. And I'm thinking, when's my symbol of the butterfly being around with mum? And here I am sharing such vulnerability and rawness and authenticity. And you mention a butterfly. So that's just so beautiful. And a butterfly is so symbolic because it's transitioning from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And I remember reading a, a story, it was a children's story about death and dying. And it's this little kid, he questions why he can't see his nana or his pa or whatever it was. And then it's basically, you can, I'm just in a different form. I was the caterpillar, now I'm the butterfly. So That's it's, awesome. yeah, and the monarch butterfly, you're right. They're not native or indigenous <laughs> to Saudi. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your mom and dad and, and the rest of your home life, because I think, um, you know, your mom passed away in your arms. And so that's a very intimate moment. And that's a, yeah. um, I, I would say a, one of the greatest things that can happen is for someone mm. to pass with someone who loves them, holding them. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did your mom and dad, um, specifically your mom, because that's, she's the one that, um, we were just speaking of, did she hold on to any guilt? Over, yeah. over what happened to you and your sister? Yeah. We never really spoke about it, but I'm sure she did. And to be honest, I know mum suffered depression, but it was never like openly discussed back then because she was a beautiful homemaker. Dad was the breadwinner. And, you know, mum's brood was everything to her and she would fight to the end of the earth to protect her family. But mum was although I loved her dearly and, you know, miss her every day, um, she was quite fat and frumpy. And I understand that that's, she did have a medical condition as well, ITP, and if you know that in the cops, idiopathic thrombopura pura. Yeah. So she had a blood disorder um, and was on steroids and hadn't been 100% healthy all her life. But she was a fat, frumpy mum, with all honesty. I loved her, but she was not the person I wanted to be as a mum. And, um, yeah, just, she was a beautiful person, but I didn't want to be like that. So she's been my inspiration for living a fit, healthy life. And dad instilled communication into us. So I guess, yeah, that's where mum's come about. Mm. Did, so you said, and you mentioned earlier that 
Catholic family. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not Catholic. Mm. I'm the son of a, a Protestant pastor. Step, my stepfather's a pastor. Yep. Yep. But my wife is Catholic and, and I know yep. her family and, um, you know, being Catholic in and of itself has, has some semblance of guilt built into it, right? There's yeah. Catholic guilt. It's yeah. a real thing. Um, do you believe that the lack of discussing what happened um, and uh, the lack of communicating, you know, your mother's for her communicating her guilt or any, any issues she was having or, or emotional issues she was having dealing yeah. with was, was der- a derivative of the Catholic upbringing and, and the way things were done. I do that believe generation. that. Yeah. And you've touched on a really raw point and I'm going to speak about it because we were raised in Ballarat, a very Catholic community, which George Pell, who you would know. Yep. Okay. He was our parish priest. He used to come to our family home. And when it came out about the abuse with us, it was a a border in the Catholic system. And mum, being Catholic, she was a staunch Catholic. And we used to have Bible classes at home. And as I said, Father Pell, as he was then, used to come to home. And my brother was an altar server. And I will say no more. So we've got three children. And three pretty much suffered child sexual abuse. And, uh, yeah, mum sought solace in the Catholic Church and Father Pell said, don't say anything. He told us to keep what had happened to us to ourselves because I feared that this is my personal opinion. Um, You said nothing's off limits. I feared that if the abuse that happened to Susan or potentially my friend um, was made aware Things would have exacerbated in the Catholic system and, you know, there would have been more uncovering into the Catholic system and the abuse would have come out because Pell shared with Jerry Ridsdale and things were were covered up there. So that's as much as I'll go into that. Um, I know, you know, there's cases with Father Pell or Archbishop Pell now and he's locked up in jail as we speak. Um, But Mum wanted to seek solace with Father Pell and nothing was done. So she lost a lot of faith in the Catholic system then or Catholic church then. Yeah, and I won't get political, or not political, religious, because Dad was a Protestant as well. He did support Mum with her faith, um, but that was part of the faith or part of the timing when my faith was challenged and when Mum nearly died in, in my year 12, my end of high school, because she was unwell. That also tested my faith and... I actually stopped going to church. I said to mum, I said, mum, I'd rather be a good person or good Christian than a hypocritical Catholic. And so I had issues with the Catholic doctrine. And as it is now, you know, there's Uh, so many pedophiles, which which also has empowered me to establish Brave Hearts, which is um, a, a charity for child sexual assault. It was founded in 97 in Queensland, but I have started the branch in Port Macquarie on the mid-north coast and that's that's helped me get through my child abuse and also other things I think taking control yeah over the 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 events that happened um Mm. and you know faith is a huge part of my life um Mm. I had grown away from my faith during after my brother's death and dealt um, with a lot of anger at God for, you know, why would you do that to me? Leave me alone and take my brother and someone who was you know, autistic and stuttered and was the most pure, honest, kind, loving kid on the planet. And, and I was not that. And, mm. and I had the guilt of, of trying to figure out why did I survival guilt? Yeah. You know, gigantic. Mm. And, yeah. and yeah. more so of, I'm a, I'm a problem solver and that's just how I'm wired. And, and it was a problem I couldn't solve. And I couldn't understand um, the logic, human logic, as to why um, a benevolent and loving God would take a baby or a, my brother or anyone that, that was, yeah. was not at fault for anything, didn't do anything wrong. And, and I, was, I struggled with that. And, and I can only imagine um, if you are Catholic and someone within the, the Catholic hierarchy of the church was the um, attacker, for lack of a better word, and how you would then be okay with 
mm. Catholic. Like, how do you how mm. do you how do you rectify that in your brain to to allow your faith to still be strong and still have that conviction that that um, God takes care of everybody, all of His children, and and having those those doubts and those questions, I can only imagine. And mm. and my faith is is as strong as it's ever been, but it wasn't until I realized that I am not. Um, why is not an answer I'm ever going to get? No, you no, know, you can't question that because I think everyone on this planet, all seven plus billion people, Matt, you know, why? Why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? Like babies that lose their life. And yeah, you just can't question, well, you can question it, but you won't get those answers. Um, just on the Catholicism, um, in general, the Catholic doctrine and church is good. It's individuals within that and within any religion. And there is a saying that priests don't become pedophiles, pedophiles become priests. It's which a, is a uh, sad indictment. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, I think the, um, the fact that it's not a, a job, for lack of a better word, being a priest or a nun is a job, right? It's a, ultimately, it's, it's your profession and your, it's your vocation and your avocation at the same time. And I don't believe that there's a um, there's a, a volume there. I think there's a volume issue in in the Catholic Church on the number of priests and the number of nuns that they have. And I think when any in any business, when there is a um, a volume need, when you need more of something, um, you start to allow for desperation. Um, yeah, and desperation creeps in, and then allows you to to take what was St your stringent, lower standards. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I don't think that's any different looking at it from a, a business side than any other business there is. The problem is, is that we take that business of being a priest and we, we have to remove the context of business from it and put it into this deity type. Um, you're my leader. You're my, mm -hmm. uh, all those things that you're my protector. You're my, you know, the flock, the shepherd of the flock, like all those other uh, terms of identities that a priest has outside of being a, a, an employee of the Catholic church. Yeah. That's when things get weird. And, you know, my, my, for me, it's difficult to understand why someone would want to be a priest. Well, and we're human beings, Matt, if I can interrupt. Yeah. We're hardwired for procreation. To take on a vow of celibacy is unnatural. And this is where I'm coming into myself and nothing's off limits. My yeah. maiden name was coming. And, the family motto is like a lion and courage. So that's why I'm branded as the couragepreneur. Um, and I personally don't have any issues with being a female and reaching a climax. Mm -hmm. And I want to allow other women mainly because obviously I can intimately relate to women because, you know, to go through that abuse and hating men and using my body for a tool and a weapon against them to now going, my God, this is such a temple celebrated, is really empowering. And the more I'm authentic and embracing my sensuality, the greater impact I can have on women because it's not only the sexual connotation, it's the taking power back, taking control back, taking your worth back. You know, the psychology of a woman not being able to orgasm is huge, and a man, is huge. And if I can help women come into their own, pun intended, I'm absolutely loving that. It's a, and I, it's being the onion skin is being revealed. I think that's, um, hey, I, I wasn't expecting this conversation to go down that road, <laughs> but I'm all for it. I'm good. I love it. I love it. That's why I love my show. That's why I love my show. <laughs> I had no idea that that's the left we were going to make, but I'm glad we did. <laughs> and I think because it, it, you just take the totality of your story and totality of, of the events that have happened to you and, and how you got to from five years old to 50, what are you, 51? Three, three. 53. Fit from five to 53 and the, the journey that you've taken and the value of um, understanding that what was taken from you at a very early age wasn't permanently taken. It wasn't mm. forever. And mm. that through um, 
self-awareness, through um, soul searching, through um, probably sharing openly with some people that, that you trusted, um, mm -hmm. helped you to get to a point where you realized that whatever track you were on was not the proper track for you to have the most successful life. And it's no different whether it's um, understanding sexuality or understanding self-worth or understanding um, looking in the mirror, do I like what I see or don't, and, or any of those things. That the, um, the value of being present in your own life is the key to it all. And when I, you know, I mentor kids and I try to share with them that while your Snapchat story might be really important today, it's really not anything in the grand scheme of life. Like your, your, your number of likes on, on Instagram or any of those things, that, but how you see yourself today and how you see yourself growing every day thereafter and the impact you can have in your own life and then externally take that impact and put it out on someone else is the most important value you can get, whether you're 13 years old or 53. And some people don't have to go through with all the traumas that you've gone through. Some people do, and, and not everybody ends up at the same place at the same time at the same age. Mm. And, and the value that, that I get from our conversation thus far is that you are very self-aware of every ounce of yourself and every ounce of your journey, so, that, so much so that it exudes through the camera. Like you're on the other Aww. side of the goddamn planet. <laughs> Thank and, you, Matt. But Thank it exudes. You. Your, your, yeah, your eyes yeah. tell the story. So my, I'm a human behavior and body language expert. That's like my gift to the world, right? Okay. So sitting here on, on camera, that's why I do video interviews because I can read yeah. body language and understand whether or not I'm getting genuine information back or whether or not um, someone's holding back. Like all those things, it, it's part of me and why I enjoy this, this medium. But I your joy and your confidence exudes out through oh, the screen. So thank I am, you. I'm very happy that, that we've had a chance to have the conversation that allowed us to go through the, <laughs> the ugly parts and then yeah. make a left turn about orgasms <laughs> and head down, head down <laughs> the path I of, say, I've come a long way. Literally. Yes. And, and, because, but I, but I, but yeah, I think that's important yeah. to like, yeah. I've, I've been married to my wife now for, you know, going on 23 uh, years, um, maybe yeah. three years. And yeah. you know, I, I, in my earlier version of me, during my darker periods, I was similar in the fact that I, um, I didn't really care too much about um, relationships or anything. I just, I was a, a the tail wagon mutt and uh, I, I liked the party and I enjoyed the process of, of, of hooking up with a chick and, and yeah, making that yeah. my conquest for the weekend and tearing yeah, it up when yeah. I was done. And that, that, that was an yeah. old version of myself. And, mm. and to be able to be intimate with somebody for 23 years, 25 dating total with it's the same beautiful. person and never yeah. having to worry about finding that outside of that relationship to yeah. me is, is what I, when beautiful. I think of, it's mm. amazing. And, and to be able to, my wife, we bust each other's chops. We, you know, we, to have that kind of connection with somebody and that is beautiful and that value it of, of, yeah. of being um, loved mm. in, in all aspects of you that have world. to love yourself yep. first before you can love someone else. Yeah. Yep. Let me ask you this. And, I want to ask you about your yep. kids um, yep. because I think one of the greatest things I've, I've realized is when I, since my daughter was about five and my son was born, that's when I started to, clear out of the fog of depression and I started to begin to really parent for the purpose like I really work hard to make mm. sure my kids being a present parent world. yeah I just wanted to be yeah. really good human yeah. beings and that they yep. understand yep. life and that it's not unicorns and rainbows and that shit happens and that you're gonna get shit on and somebody's gonna hurt you and you're gonna have to get up and yep. you have some grit and resiliency and all that stuff so I, I take yep. great pride in that when you um, had children, was it an immediate, because I think it's different for a woman sometimes, that, that motherly instinct I think is there for the most part for everybody, at, all, all women. Did you have this like overriding mama bear um, <laughs> like feeling that I got to protect yeah. my, my kids and I want to make Ooh. sure that they have everything? Absolutely. And uh, that's another part of my journey. When I was, my ex-husband has a Down syndrome sister. 
So when I was pregnant, we were obviously married and tried to have a kid. When I was pregnant with my firstborn, Sam, I thought I was seven weeks. I went to the doctor. I was 11 weeks. Mrs. Picks, you'll always get the long-winded version. And he suggested I have an amniocentesis because, um, yeah, I had a nuchal fold test and we thought we were carrying a Down syndrome child. And being raised a Catholic, you don't terminate. And so I didn't actually communicate my, my decision, my, mine and my husband, I will say, joint decision with my mum or others. So my pregnancy was quite private for 17 weeks. And then I had the amnio and I actually announced my pregnancy and he was born at 35 weeks. So I had a short pregnancy, but yeah, he was born perfectly normal, perfectly fine. Um, but I vowed and, and I did disclose to my ex-husband about the abuse and also my daughter when she was born. I absolutely wholeheartedly, hand on heart, protected them. Maybe kind of helicopter parenting too much with adults, but there were so many synergies with our first family home because the next door neighbour, his name was the same name on the same side as we're growing up. He had a big shed out the back. He had gladioli and you're talking about triggers, uh, you know, with a butterfly, which is a beautiful symbol of your brother. The gladioli, the flower, was a trigger for me. And I just never would I allow my kids to go into his home, even if his wife was there. But they would never go into his home without me being there. And that was, I don't, I, I think that's justified. You know, I never disclosed so. to the kids, although they're 24. Um, handsome, son, handsome son, Sambo, Sam, and um, gorgeous 21-year-old Katie Kate. Uh, and they kind of call me Mama Bear, so that's why I laugh. But yeah, my, ironically, my sister said, "Oh, you'll never have kids. You're too bloody impatient." <laughs> so I wanted four, but I, I split the difference with two because I didn't want to risk that Downs thing either. But yeah, I definitely have protected my kids. Um, but again, uh, loving my mum and dad, but they were in their late thirties when they had me, so quite old school in their thinking. Whereas I'm nothing's off air, as you've seen. Sam, you're sexually active. Get condoms, this is how you put it on, practice it without, you know, before a girl. Katie, you're going to be bleeding. This is how you use tampons, rah, rah, rah. I was open and my kids go, oh, my God, mum, now they value that because we have that open communication where they don't tell me everything, I get that. Um, and if they watch this, they'll go, oh, my God, mum, did you say that? <laughs> but, hey, that's me. It makes me who I am. So who is Pitts? Yeah, that's me. Well, it's funny you say that because um, I don't know if you saw on Facebook, I was out with my mom last night. So yeah, my 75th yeah, birthday. Yeah, and my mom, yeah, beautiful. you know, my, my biological father left when I was nine months old. My, my mom got remarried when I was 12. So there was a, about an 11 year period where yeah. it was just me, my mom and my brother. And my mm. mom was, you know, she was a cocktail waitress at night. She, you know, she just was, she worked three jobs and she was just always yeah. trying to figure out how to provide. And we were pretty poor. And, um, but she, we always had, we had moments of conversation because we didn't have a lot of time always together mm. because she was tr always out working and trying to figure out how to create um, funds. So we were very clear and concise in our conversation skills because there wasn't a whole lot of time to yeah. the, the huff and puff and, and all that kind of stuff. So we had a rule that everything was open. You could even curse. Um, I, I started cursing. Yep. I was dropping F-bombs when I was like eight. Um, but it was, <laughs> the rule was, the rule was yeah. you couldn't curse at the person you're talking to. Person, yeah. yeah like I yeah. could say my fucking dad yeah. is pissing me off and that's yep. okay, but I couldn't say fuck you mom. Like, you know, it was like yeah, totally yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So growing up, yep. we always had this very open, easy, um, and yeah. I think my mom was, she's a little bit hippie-ish anyways in her <laughs> growing up, you know, yeah. wore moccasins yeah. and, and all that. But yeah. um, I wrote a letter to my mom um, for her birthday and every, that was the gift I gave her. I got a bunch of people. Oh, letters and, yep. uh, so I wrote a letter to my mom and I said, and every time I call, and my, my mom has, has Alzheimer's, and, um, but every time I call her, she's like, why is our, why is our relationship so easy? And I said, oh, how beautiful. I said, I don't know, mom. I said, I think it's because we never have to worry about whether we love each other. Like there's mm. never, we don't, that's not any a, question. No. Yeah. And she mm. goes, we don't need to talk every day, but when we talk, we talk about real things. And I said, yeah, we do. And so I wrote in the letter about how growing up, I never had to worry about what my mom meant or wanted or what the expectations were. It was always very clear. And then I, 
yeah. back, back and forth. That was the way it was. So I think when you mentioned how you were very open and honest in your communication, that's kind of the way my mom was. You know, she said, if you're going to yeah, do drugs, yep. you're going to do them in front of me because I'm going to make sure that you're safe. And you do. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, yep. like that was always her. And I'm like, mom, like, I'm, I'm yep. not going to do drugs in front of you. Let's just, that's one <laughs> thing I'm not doing. But, um, yeah. but that's the way her mindset was. So it was very much similar to the way that you were parenting your mm. kids. Now, what are you, what's your relationship like with your kids today? Like, is it super tight? Oh, yeah, phenomenal. Um, I do live with my daughter. She's on holiday in Thailand at the moment, mm. you know, and I'm stoked with that. Um, partly because we moved back in for that emotional support, really, because she's been through a bit. And, you know, I'm, whilst I'm positive, my life isn't what I imagined a 53-year-old woman would be at, you know, renting and single and, you know, still not personally and professionally where I want to be, but that's okay because I'm on that journey. Uh, so we're to living together. And then my son, he lives a thousand Ks away and, you know, we, we get in far, touch. Right? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But he's a great kid and, you know, he went through some tough times. He was a tough kid to parent, um, partly because, yeah, it was a lot of single parenting on my behalf and he didn't get that really strong male role model, even though Mick was there, he was a bit too soft. Um, but yeah, they're both really good, resilient kids, great jobs and really kind people. So, that's great. you know, I, I couldn't love, want for more than that. that. Because that's, yeah. that, that you ended the cycle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you sort of said enough and, yeah. and I'm going to make yeah. sure that, that my kids have um yeah a shot and and it's yeah it's not that your mom and dad did anything wrong it's just that no it was yeah. a uh, just a different, different time yeah and it was just yeah a different life yeah. um yeah. so anyways before we get roll i want to make sure that that we share um your book information we share your website um the stuff that you're doing so how people can find yep. you and all that kind of stuff yep sure so let's talk Thanks, about your book Nat. real quick okay well let's think and get rich after hours and it's a, a work in progress and initially the old picks wrote it because she wanted to be a published author, but that's about me. The new picks, I want to write it or I'm writing it because I want to impact people. So it's, it is a work in progress and I don't want to say a due date. It was due out 2018, but with everything happened with losses and death and that, the book just took a back seat. Um, but I'm interviewing expert mentors of mine and it's based off the mentors method of success and mentors being mindset, education, negotiation, tools, opportunities, relationships and success. And I interview successful people, one being Dr. John Martini, an amazing thought leader um, and, you know, other business leaders from around the globe. I've got pre-sales in 19 countries, so I know that that's going to make an impact. Um, I've had it edited by um, a UK editor. And she said, picks, it's like a corporate PowerPoint. You need to actually put more picks in it. So that's why I wasn't ready to share the, the picks, whereas now the picks factor's coming out as you have uncovered some of it. Um, so, yeah, I'm certainly able to take names for people that would like the book. I'm not taking any money because I don't want to be beholden. But that's certainly on offering. It's based off Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, and I do have approval from the Napoleon Hill Foundation. So super stoked about that. Uh, yeah, and best method of getting in contact, obviously LinkedIn, Facebook or Insta, just under my name, Pix Jonathan. that's P-I-X-J-O-N-A-S-S-O-N. -S -S yes, Pix is my real name. I was only two pound two when I was born. So that's another challenge that I've overcome. Um, or they can email me, Pix at PixJonathan.com. Well, it's, it's been amazing. Um... I love the fact that I don't really know much before I do my show <laughs> because it, it is, it's fun. It's fun to just yeah. sort of uncover. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, I, I never know. Cut. Yeah. Well, I never, I never know yeah. how it's going to go. And, and, and yeah. I always, and the reason I asked the question who has picked Jonathan is because who you think you are is maybe different than what I interpret from, you know, a website yeah. or a Facebook or, or whatever the case might be. And so I, I just think it's fun yeah. to go on a journey um, without any predetermined um, destination. And uh, it's kind of like a nomad. My, I call her my sister. Yep. So, um, we, I grew up, me and my brother and then my mom's best friend had two kids, Christy and Billy. And Billy passed away. Yep. Um, and my brother passed away. Yep. And so it's just Christy and I left. And she lives, she's, uh, she's a nomad. She yeah. lives all over, the country, all over the world. She lives in, in uh, the Netherlands right now. She used to live in China. She's lived all over. 
but she called digital herself, no, yeah, global nomad. Yeah. Yeah. She called herself the nomad and she wrote a letter to my mom for her birthday yeah. and it says, love your nomad daughter. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, I love having a nomad show. Special. There's, mm. there's no real um, plan. Yeah. So I appreciate you being on. Yep. Um, don't go anywhere. We're going to end the show here in a second with a little bit of uh, music here in about two seconds. And then uh, I just wanted to say thank you. And everybody, um, thank you for listening to this episode of the Two Dates in the Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Thank you to my man, Rob Rennie, working the, uh, the production. And uh, for God's sake, it's go out and be kind to one another. Check me out right here, yo. Turn the track up a little bit. All up in my ear.